There it is. All right, we're live. All right, I want to give a quick introduction here before we start talking about uh, any <laughs> talking about you. Uh, so I have a pretty great guest, I think, for my audience, which is the largely an Android-based community. He is a he was an Android engineer. I guess he would still call himself an Android engineer, but uh, he's employed as a full stack developer. If you don't know what a full stack developer, we're going to be talking about that later. Um, his name is Aiden. I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Aiden. <laughs> it is uh, Follested. Follested. Okay, that's what I thought. I just thought maybe it was like something weird in there, but okay, that's good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about his jobs. He used to work at uh, Target, which is a large retail company in the U.S., and now he works for Square. It's a uh, payment, I guess, accepting system. They make uh, POS software and accepting mobile payments online. Uh, all kinds of payment stuff, and that's where he works as a full stack developer now. And um, yeah, so without talking too much more about that, uh, tell us your story, Aiden, and how you. Oh, sorry, one more thing. He's only twenty three. That is that's the <laughs> biggest thing right here that definitely makes him stand out. Um, so tell us how you got started with uh, software development. Yeah, so um, I grew up pretty into um, video games. So when I was about 12 or 13, I would say um, I suddenly got a very strong desire to actually make video games. Um, so 12 I played or 13, that. that's, that's pretty young. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to do like the graphic design, the, the game engine, like everything basically on my own. Um, so I started learning C and C++. Uh, my dad got me a book on uh, C++ at a library when we were actually going to my grandma's house, um, <laughs> funny enough. Um, so I started to learn uh, C and C++. Uh, I actually found it very difficult at the time, so I kind of put it off for a little bit after I started to learn. Um, yeah, th I think those are two of the, like, the most difficult languages to start with, aren't they? Very, yeah. They're like almost the lowest level you can get uh, above like assembly and whatever else. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, like if you were to start with Python or something, I'm sure you would have had a much better time. Yeah, although um, I will say C and, C and C++ are... Um, it, they're the very standardized, um, I guess it's it's the standard syntax for most languages these days. Like if you learn Java or Kotlin or really anything, they all kind of follow this basic structure that C and C++ kind of started out with. Um, like create objects, make methods, call yeah. methods, that that kind of thing, right? Yeah, like the standard uh, object-oriented language. Um, yeah. Structure, yeah. They kind of started it all. So if you were to learn like Python where it uses indentation or some of those other weird languages out there, um, I guess they don't give you quite as good of a foundation for other languages in the future. It's kind of like learning um, like Spanish or French uh, and then kind of being able to unlock all of the Latin languages out in the world or just in general be really good at learning new languages. Um, mm -hmm. So difficult at first, but definitely overall it paid off dividends is what you're saying. Indeed, yeah. It kind of, it, it bends your brain to think in the way that a computer science uh, person would. So <laughs> I have a question. Just to, yeah. to, to stop you. Um, so your dad bought you this book. Mm -hmm. so is, your, is your dad, a, was he a programmer or like what, what does he do? Uh, what did he do as a job at, the, at that time? Uh, at the time, he actually worked for um, Best Buy Corporate as a sales guy. Um, he's never been really a, a programmer himself, but he's always been into technology and um, that sort of thing. Now he actually works for Augusto, who are based in Minneapolis, but he actually moved out to California with me um, when I did. Uh, He's an account ex executive there, so he manages um, big companies that use Google software, uh, like G Suites or everything that comes with that. So. Cool, um, that, that's awesome. I always wondered because uh, my my family, all of my family are pretty much entrepreneurs. Almost none of them went to college. Uh, my grandpa, my dad, my uncle, my uncles, all of them. Um, and it it took me a long time to get into software development. I didn't start until I was, I didn't program anything i didn't touch coding until i was probably 25. wow yeah and just because i had no no one was like hey mitch you should try programming <laughs> <laughs> it was right. like <clears throat> same kind of story as you i liked games and mm -hmm. uh i remember back in the day i don't know if you played i'm a little older than you do you remember <laughs> counter-strike 1.6 did you ever play that i don't know about 1.6 but <laughs> yeah I'm too, I'm too, I'm too old. so that was before like that was before source that was before cs oh Force. yeah Wow. Yeah, and like I, I remember doing things in there because it's a pretty old game, and you could get into the files, and you could like make mm. custom spray paints, and like mm -hmm. you could hack and like make yourself a superhero. So I was always like messing around with that, but mm -hmm. it was never like 
I didn't even know what programming was. I was like, oh, I can do this cool thing. I'm going right. to do that. Yeah, how but, old uh, are you now, by the way? I'm, I'm 28. Oh, okay. So not a ton older. No, but just old enough that you don't know what CS 1.6 is. That's right. the old, old school shooter game. Did they teach um, computer science at your school back in the day? Yeah, uh, they took they, they taught uh, computer science at my school, but the program wasn't great. Mm. And there was no reason for me to go into it because mm. um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to university in the first place. Basically, mm. my family said, Mitch, you should go to university. I said, OK, I guess. That seems <laughs> and, like the pretty, the pretty common thing. Like People are kind of told by society and their parents that they have to go to college right mm -hmm. after high school. And then they go in really having no idea what they want to do in life. So they end up wasting four years of five for me. Or, or that, yeah, of, of <laughs> uh, very, very expensive um, pieces of paper yes. for something that you probably won't want to really actually do for the rest of your life. So, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a complete waste. I, t I took physics and engineering. And that is so fun. It, it was, uh, yeah, it was, I, I don't, I'm not ready to say that I wasted it, <laughs> but uh, I think it was valuable because it made me think that I can learn anything pretty much mm -hmm. after I finished that I was like oh well these other problems seem simple now it, right. that was that was sort of the thing that I got from it but I don't know if that's worth five years that, <laughs> I'm not convinced that's worth five years that is that's a long time that's for sure <laughs> yeah so anyway uh, what were we talking about so your 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 dad got you a book you started C and C sharp or C plus plus C plus plus yeah C plus plus uh, you started messing around with game stuff thought it was pretty difficult you were 12 13 where did where'd you go from there? Uh, so I kind of just kept pushing myself. Um, I made a lot of command line interface applications. I actually uh, kind of wanted to become an ethical hacker for a while there too. Um, got into the .NET framework and made a lot of Windows applications. And uh, C Sharp kind of got me into the Java mindset. So eventually I made it to Java, um, which unlocked really the rest of my career uh, with Android and a lot of server stuff. and. So, so were you programming a lot when, like, when did you, like you said, when you were 12, 13, you found it really difficult. Mm -hmm. When did you really like, how, like, I want to know, like how often you were programming? Um, did your friends program? Like how, when in high school, like, did you stay home on weekends and program? That's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah, I, I probably put way more time into computers than I should have. Uh, like, I guess my mom, especially, um, Nowadays, she tells me, uh, you spent so much time in the basement, I thought you would never leave. Like, get, your, <laughs> get your own apartment, get your own house, uh, get, get a job. She thought I was just going to stay in the basement forever. Um, but in all the time that I was in the basement, I was spending countless hours on learning new languages and frameworks and uh, making myself what I am today, I guess. So, so there, mom. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Cool. Okay. So, so lots of time. So did you give up games completely and just switch to programming or did you do a little bit of both? Uh, I'm assuming both. Yeah, I, I, I guess the challenge, the main challenge with games is uh, the 3D modeling part. I wanted to make very vast like 3D environments and, um, and such. And I, I did not have time to specialize in graphic design um, and to not have any friends that did it and didn't want to start a company at 12 <laughs> or 13 to hire employees. So it, it became very difficult for one person to really get into game development by themselves. I think game development is not necessarily something you really want to be in right now anyway. Like I hear it's very competitive mm. and it very, and because it's so competitive, the lifestyle is kind of shit because uh, yeah. you have so many people, uh, drives the wages down, mm -hmm. you know, so it might not be a bad thing after all. True. And now I hear like EA and all the big game companies are losing tons of money because of Fortnite. Cause Fortnite offers their game for free. And they're they're beating everyone's ass with, when it comes to revenue. <laughs> do you like do you like Fortnite? Do you play Fortnite? I do not. I don't, <laughs> I've tried I don't it. like it. I've tried it. Yeah, I've tried it. I did not like it. <laughs> it's like uh, I I didn't even like PUBG, but I thought PUBG was a good game. But mm -hmm. I was like, uh, I don't know. I played it and I would just die, and I didn't see. <laughs> I didn't even see anybody. Yeah. And like, and then yeah. I would watch my friends play, and they'd be like walking around and all of a sudden they'd start shooting at stuff and be like there's a guy there's a guy and he killed yeah. him and i'm like i didn't literally didn't see anybody <laughs> it's like you were shooting at nothing and then you just killed someone so I'm like, yeah. okay, maybe this game isn't for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the battle royale format is super big right now even call of duty is doing it mm -hmm. too which yeah. I actually their version is a lot better than pub if you ask me but. yeah uh most of my friends <laughs> play uh black ops is what you're talking about right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah most of my friends play that but we're all old maybe maybe like fortnite's <laughs> for kids i don't know but 
I would agree with that statement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm equally bad at all of them, so that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so did you go to college? Uh, so yeah, after high school, I went to college only for a year. Um, so I I went to school at Central in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, ended up going to the University of Wisconsin Stouts, um, obviously in Wisconsin uh, for a year, majoring in applied mathematics and computer science. Um, but after a year, I felt like I didn't like the environments. Um, in Wisconsin, there was a lot of, uh, well, it was a small town. There's kind of a lot of intolerance for other people that I, uh, that I kind of picked up on. Um, I didn't like, yeah, like I said, I didn't really like the people there too much. Um, and I felt like my, my career didn't need a degree. I was already very experienced. Um, so I kind of left my first year of college thinking I didn't want to go back, um, at least not at the time. Uh, so I got a couple questions. Yeah. So uh, they were rednecks is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah that's that's what I, for. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say rednecks, but yeah. The, the, yeah. Te the technical term is redneck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, second question. Uh, so when you did applied math, you just said applied mathematics, I think, right? And computer science, yeah. And computer science, yeah. yeah. So did you did you do a lot of, I guess you only did one year, but did you do a lot of like data structures and algorithms in that first year? I did. So I tested through, um, I think one or two, actually more like two or three. I, I tested out of like two or three computer science classes. So I ended up in um, a class that taught like a x86 Intel assembly language uh, and also data structures and algorithms. So I did have to get subjected to the intense. Um, it's terrible. Trees and stuff. Yeah, it's it's very terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. Like, and you don't use that in, in most jobs unless you're making video games or very large search engines or something very complex. And like, but. and like, wouldn't you just Google how to? Yeah. Like, yeah. You, if you had a problem, you're you're gonna you're gonna all you gotta do is outline the problem, mm -hmm. and then Google what <laughs> the outline is, and then yeah. you're gonna get an algorithm. You're gonna yeah. get a solution. Yeah. Why, why do I got to memorize these things? That's my question. And I've never been to a job interview where they actually ask for that. They still do that. They still do this. <laughs> I, I just, I was talking to a friend of mine today. Uh, he, he interviewed at a, I want to say the company name because it pisses me off that they, <laughs> they asked him data structure and algorithms and how to solve um, uh, complicated uh, problems in an interview. I think it's, it's, it's like outdated. I think mm -hmm. you should give them a project. Say, yeah. take home this project, mm -hmm. have it for, you know, I don't know, 24 hours or whatever. That's what but I've had. That, yeah. yeah my that's... last two interviews, it, it was just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. So, okay. Yeah. So the good companies do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Target <laughs> and Square both did that. Because <laughs> I've interviewed for a few uh, jobs just to see what the interviewing process was like. And mm -hmm. the ones that I did also gave projects. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a few that seem to be doing sort of this, what I would call outdated way of interviewing which doesn't really tell you anything and it, it tells you that he's got a good memory that's mm -hmm. it, that's what it tells you exactly yeah yeah so anyway there's my rant done for the day <laughs> on data structures and algorithms <laughs> it is horrible to learn though too it's so boring yeah and like o notation too like who actually uses well o notation yeah i God. guess i guess i could see where o notation would be valuable like uh even i guess in mobile application design uh I would say most people should be conscious about loops and things that could slow down anything on a, on a mobile app because obviously phones, although phones are getting very uh, powerful these days, phones are lesser than like a server. So you should be conscious of loops and loops, Bad loops idea. And, and memory and all that, that stuff. But okay. Still. <laughs> yes. Um, so where were we now? So we were talking about your school, uh, talked about shitty, data structures and algorithms. So your first job, was your first job at Target when you, when you, after you're out of your uh, college? It was not. Uh, so actually in high school, I think it was maybe my sophomore year, maybe, may, maybe even been my freshman year. Um, I had this friend, uh, Sherwa, who was a grade, uh, a grade above me. He was in my, um, my computer science class actually in high school. Um, <laughs> I was taking it for credit. Com high school computer science classes are they're just way too easy. I feel like they need to challenge. We had more. we had some in my high school. I remember I wasn't in any of them, but yeah. I had people who would tell me about what they would do in them. Like yeah. my my girlfriend was in one, for example, and she like mm, <laughs> uh, <laughs> little iffy around a computer, <laughs> and she and she was yeah. she was in one, and she had a good time and got a good grade. So mm -hmm. I don't know. 
probably not the most intense uh, course structure. Yeah, I feel like they, they need to get better about it. Um, like kind of sidetracking from what you were talking about. Um, I feel like they need to get better about computer science in schools because, um, well, for one, like there's not enough women in technology. I feel like if schools or really the government or anyone had more programs that made computer science fun, um, a lot more women would get into it. Uh, there, there's like a stigma that you have to be like a complete geek that wears glasses and doesn't have friends like to be in the, the field of computer science, but it's actually like, like a really a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a cool thing to be in. It's, it's like its own art form. I, I, I think about it as like an like a art form, like I'm drawing. I agree. I actually on a, agree on a canvas. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like schools and the federal government need more programs. They need to make computer science fun to attract a lot more uh, women, just more people in general to the field because it's an ever-growing industry. We're never going to run out of jobs at this point with people that are in computer science. So, yeah. Uh, what do you, what do you think? I was just, I remember in my, I think it was my, not my last interview, the one before when I had Matt Tran on here, we were mm -hmm. talking about, um, this thing you, we, I mean, headlines, we're reading headlines mm -hmm. and, uh, there's all, I, I often see, uh, soon there will be no jobs. There will be <laughs> square will do everything for you. There'll, there'll be no more programmers needed. Yeah, like robots making all the programs. Look that doesn't make any sense. Even even if robots can write software, there still has to be someone to write the software for the robots. So it's like it's like chicken and the chicken and the egg problem. Exactly. Like there's always going to be someone to write the software. So even if all the jobs go away, there still has to be programmers. Yeah, to maintain <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. stupid. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and actually, kind of related to that, uh, there's all these people that think you know China's stealing all of our jobs. All of our jobs are being shipped out of the country. They took our jobs. Yeah, South Park. Uh, <laughs> I, I I saw this. Um, there's a show called Adam Ruins Everything where they talk about um, certain subjects uh, in the world and they like debunk why this way of thinking is just not right. Like uh, there is an episode about how uh, factory workers from like the boom era, um, like the boomers, they, they think yeah. that all of their jobs are just gone forever. Um, actually not forever. They think that they can bring the factory jobs back to the United States um, from China. Uh, but he, he goes into the fact that, um, China just has this, uh, unique advantage in the world where they have all of the, um, distributors, like the manufacturers that make the parts for an iPhone, they're all yeah, in that close. region of the world. Everything's close. Yeah. So even if we bring like a massive iPhone factory to the United States, um, the parts we'll are coming still from have China. to ship all the parts from China. Yeah. And there's no way we could ever get all that manufacturing back here. So it's literally impossible for that to ever happen. And the only reason that the United States ever had um, lots of factory jobs is because uh, World War II destroyed all of our competitors and it created a, a large boom in the United States where 50% of the entire world's manufacturing came here. So, oh, um, fun fact. Yeah, but related to that, um, even though we don't have a lot of factory jobs, there are a lot of like hard labor jobs. Um, the current state of the world has made our service industry boom. So there's obviously there's like restaurant workers, which a lot of people kind of look down upon. Um, but with all the hardware that comes from China, there's all these programming jobs, um, there's customer service, there's sales, like there's never been a better time in America for service jobs. So craft, craft beer and like, yeah, breweries, they, breweries they are too, all yeah. over the place. It seems yeah. like, and, and I like it. I love, I'm like, Oh, there's one on this block. There's one yeah. on that block. I'm going to go eat and drink here today. And then I'm going to eat and drink there tomorrow. Yeah. California is chock full of breweries and wineries. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, it's very similar here in BC uh, more and more all the time. We, we have, we have like a climate that's pretty similar to California mm -hmm. up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's more like six months of winter, six months of like summer mm -hmm. similar to california where it's a desert mm -hmm. and it's just all wineries so there's tons nice. of you go up there and you just go on wine tours you hang out drink wine eat food and then mm -hmm. you come down to the lower mainland which is the valley mm -hmm. and uh there's all these craft breweries so nice. pretty cool yeah I, I heard a little bit of your accent there too for a second <laughs> what what's my really like yeah. i have an accent you're like a <laughs> bc is like british columbia yes yeah i, I heard the little the oots the, <laughs> the what the, the oots uh like you know oh, the oh the uh, boots the stereotypical yeah the canadian stereotype accent. canadian yeah <laughs> I, i've been told that i don't have much of a canadian accent but uh yeah you don't have much either really at all i always get people um telling me that i don't have much of a minnesota accent either but every once in a while it kind of pops itself out well we're people of the internet we we listen to all types so we're like hybrids true true and <laughs> urban yeah apparently people in 
cities don't get much of an accent. But. I guess it's so diverse. Mm -hmm. Um. So where the yeah we went way off on a tangent. Way of course, yeah. Um, where the hell were we? <laughs> Your first you job. Were at college. First job. Oh, first job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So there was a uh, my kid ahead of me uh, in high school. Um, we were in the same computer science class, and he got a job offer at a little startup uh, back in Minnesota uh, called Rico Solutions. I actually don't think they're around anymore. Um, but their their owners were uh, married. Uh, one of their owners was uh, a huge wine uh, connoisseur. So she had a business about basically helping people find uh, the types of wines that they like. Um, and when you like them, you could store them in an application. So there was a website and a mobile app where you could basically have a virtual seller to keep track of all the wines that are in your house, um, have, a, have a wish list, all that, that kind of stuff. Um, and her husband worked at Oracle. So basically, they made this little startup for uh, contracting application development out to clients. So me and this kid I knew in high school worked for them for about two years and we made uh, some mobile apps that you wouldn't hear about anymore because I don't think they're around. But it was, but it they was my first job. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a job. I'm sure that I'm sure the first one for everybody is uh, a little Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause you're and just it, gonna you're gonna throw it together. You don't know what you don't know you probably don't know about best practices. You don't know about a true. lot of that kind of stuff. Which yeah. is that's the way she goes. I mean, it's it's his fault if he's going to complain about the quality if he hired a kid out of high school. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, and it it gave me some good uh, some good experience in my resume too, and I, that obviously unlocks the future if you have a lot of experience. Because if you get to my age now and you don't have any college experience or no uh, previous job experience, you're kind of just screwed. Really. Yeah, me, me at twenty five, <laughs> graduating with a physics degree here. <laughs> well, that's that's a cool degree to have, I would say. The only yeah, it that's that's all it is. The thing mm -hmm. that you get from it is that I can when I'm uh, talking to people and and they're like, "Hey, what did you take in university?" and I'm like, "Oh, I did physics." They're like, "Oh, that's sweet." <laughs> that's yeah, that's I, I what guess, I get. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess what kind of jobs would you get with physics so when you're, other than like an actual physicist? <laughs> you have to you have to do more training. That's mm -hmm. all it is. You're you basically have a degree in learning hard shit. Mm. That's, that's what it is. It's like, hey, I did physics, so I'm pretty good at thinking. And math, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. I did, yeah, so applied physics, so lots mm -hmm. of math, basically. But nice. yeah, no like practical anything, really. Just a lot of cool knowledge to have, I guess. <laughs> I, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so first job, uh, that was great. So that was, and then, so you, how long did you do that for before you went to your next job? And what was your next job? And yeah, why so that, did you decide to why did you decide to leave that? Hmm. So yeah, that, that first job was uh, about two years. I actually got paid to learn iOS development as well. I was only really specializing in Android development before that. So and he also knows iOS development. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not. I don't like it. Um, Although I love Swift, language is a great language. I do but. want to talk more about that, but let's not get off track. I will, okay. We will come back to that, why yeah. you hate iOS. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was there for two years. I got, um, they gave me a MacBook, my first MacBook. Uh, and before that, I actually thought I despised Apple products, and I actually learned to like them uh, there. They're pretty uh, awesome. The MacBook is a good computer. It is, yeah. Um, so I got paid to learn iOS development there. I did Android development. Um, after two years, uh, I decided... Uh, minimum wage in Minnesota is like seven dollars. So I think I was getting paid like ten or eleven, and I decided that wasn't enough for my for my profession. Um, so my dad actually got me in contact with a sales guy uh, at his company who was being contracted at the time, uh, and he connected me with these two guys from Minneapolis who uh, had a business called uh, Sales Fitness at the time, which was used to remotely train uh, sales people around the country. So say like a like a sales manager lives in Minnesota. Uh, they had reps like in California or some other state. Um, and the manager wanted to verify that the salespeople knew what they were doing. They knew how to properly acquire clients. Um, so the app would provide exercises that the manager would set up. They would record like a prompts video, have a description, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the reps would perform the exercise while recording themselves and submit it to this app. So it was like a two way conversational ish. Type of yeah, kind of like YouTube, yeah, but for um, for sales training, 
Uh, so when I joined them, they actually changed their name to Skill Fitness and they started branching out. So nowadays, um, they do, they still do sales, but they do, um, like leadership training. They do, um, like some weird stuff, like improv, uh, acting training, like j across the board, just anything you could think of where you could find uh, two way so like video. You, so like you grab your phone, you set it mm -hmm. up and you, and you're like looking at other people and then you're doing improv or something like that. I, yeah, that's it's kind of a weird use case. I couldn't imagine how it would work, but it's it's actually not live. So you you record a video of yourself, um, oh, okay. and then you upload it, and you can submit it with uh, comments, and they can provide like a five star rating and some textual feedback and that that kind of stuff. Um, cool. So how long did you do that for? I was there, I think, for like two years, and I did uh, Android, iOS, and .NET Framework backend stuff all all basically on my own there. So where so how old are you at this point? At, at the end of that two year period right there. Hmm. That's, that's a good question. Uh, you gotta be okay. only 20, 21. Yeah. Right. Cause it went into my, my, uh, first year of college. So I think I may have been like 18, 19 at the time, actually. Wow. Yeah. What the hell was <laughs> I doing? I was 19. <laughs> Nothing. The whole lot. <laughs> I think I think after high school I did yeah okay after high school I took a year off basically mm. and I moved up to the wine place that I was telling you about mm. it's called Kelowna mm. and I lived up there for a year and I just I got I was work I I worked at a at a marina because there's mm. lakes up there oh cool and I was a forklift driver and uh, I <laughs> that just, sounds fun actually <laughs> oh yeah I mean, it was it was a fun time I yeah. was you know going partying every weekend and uh, just working living at home for free so mm. I was rich basically. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so it was fun but uh not not productive that's for sure <laughs> well yeah people always ask me how i do what i do and i i just say i got an early start and i spent tons and tons and tons of time on it yeah i i really think that's the key the early mm -hmm. start that's that's mm -hmm. why i was so curious about how you got started because um all it takes is like that that introduction to programming like mm -hmm. somebody say hey programming is pretty cool you could build some cool shit here's a book when you're 12 and then you start doing it. Like, yeah. Actually fun it, facts kind of with that. Uh, I think even before I was 12, I used to code my own languages, like written languages, uh, just for fun. Um, and I actually took, I think about six years of Mandarin Chinese, uh, between middle school and high school. So I think I've always had a linguistic. What do you mean by code your own languages? Uh, so, I guess I don't know if coding is the right word. Um, I would write entire written languages, um, like in like, like like you're encrypting it, like it's yeah. your own. Yeah, I would make my own letters or my own characters, um, right. And write in like entire books on them um, when I was little. Interesting. So I think I think that linguistic interest kind of uh, brought me into programming a little bit as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Like if you're into that kind of stuff, and then mm -hmm. somebody shows you a programming language, it's yeah, yeah, that yeah. would that would, and you and you like computers and tech. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's right up your alley. Exactly. That, that's like the perfect storm. Yeah, yeah. So it's all kind of led up to this, I guess. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay. So, so after this, uh, this the iOS and Android job that you were doing, where you got your Mac. Uh, what what was after that, and why did you leave that job? Yeah, so I was there. I actually I, I contracted um, at this company for a month, and then they hired me full time. And I was there for two years, um, and then eventually I decided I wanted more money. <laughs> so I, uh, I I think I got a LinkedIn at that point and started uh, looking for jobs, and I ended up finding Target. Uh, and I didn't have a degree at the time. Um, I guess I didn't have a ton of job experience, so they kind of took a chance on me, uh, which was I mean, great. I mean, you had quite a bit of experience. That's that's a pretty good track record. Like, if yeah, like, yeah. I think it. Yeah, at that time it was like four and a half years. Uh, but compared to a lot of other people in the same field that had degrees and yeah, but the degree you know, doesn't mean shit, really. Like, true. It's, yeah, it's, it's the experience. It's a hundred percent the experience. Yeah, you, but like a lot of traditional, like especially a company like Target. I guess they're getting they're a lot less traditional than they used to be, but. Like they, they used to wear suits and ties and they got mm -hmm. rid of that before I joined. But I feel like for a traditional, oh, there's a cat behind me. Uh, I feel like for traditional companies like Target, um, they tend to value degrees a lot more, especially in like in Minnesota where there aren't as many startups. So like, you know, like I live in Silicon Valley now. Yeah. Very pro progressive hundreds, place. 
hundreds or thousands of startups and a lot of a lot of young people. But in a place like Minnesota, uh, programmers tend to be pretty old. Uh, like I worked with mostly 30, 40 year olds. Uh, they all have degrees. So I feel like kind of an environment like that, uh, taking in a I think I was like 20 at the time, a 20 year old without a degree, it, it's kind of a big risk for them, but they did it anyway. So I yeah. was grateful well, for that. Yeah, I mean, that's great. But honestly, if I was to look at you, I mean, I would I would say, okay, this guy started programming early. He's true, got true. four years of practical experience. He 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 did it. He basically did it on his own. Like you, mm -hmm. you're a self learner. Mm -hmm. You went and got the jobs. You did the contract work. It, you were successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. You're looking pretty good to me at that point. Yeah, I guess that's true. I would take you at 20 with that over over new grad at 25 with a physics and engineering <laughs> degree. <laughs> well, I don't know. I feel like if you have enough online presence, which you do, uh, I guess like more so like open source, a lot of open source presence, companies tend to get an idea of the kind of person you are and the kind of, um, the kind of, I guess, uh, worth work, ec work ethic that you have. Um, mm -hmm. and they kind of can look past the degree. For sure. She's helped me a lot. Online presence is a big one. Like mm -hmm. uh, for you, you you got a really popular GitHub. You have I lots do. of you have apps on the App Store. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for those of you who are wondering, check out his GitHub. I put a link in, should be a link in the description of this video. Oh, He's nice. got some really awesome libraries. That's actually how I discovered him in the first place. Mm. Um, I, I, I checked out your easy video player library. Oh yeah. Yeah, you've, now... you've gotten rid of it, I guess. Yeah, it was, it's, it's so much to maintain. I, I actually do, Fun fact, I developed that library while I worked for um, that video, that skill fitness company I was talking about. I developed it there because um, I was trying to work with the video player APIs on Android and the camera APIs on Android, and they're such a pain in the ass to use. They are that's, such a pain in the ass. That's it's one thing like, that iOS makes better, partially because of the fact that they don't have very many devices to work with, but hmm. I, I made that it's library. The devices. It's the devices, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I made that library when I was actually working at a... Uh, well, at Skill Fitness, we were at a QA lab um, that we outsourced. Um, so I had access to like every Samsung device, every Google device, every LG device. So I basically just went through all the devices and tested out my video player logic. That's awesome. And put that all into that library. But it became so much to maintain. I couldn't put it, keep up with it. <laughs> it's uh, that that's uh, that I made a custom camera course, and how mm -hmm. how I learned a lot about the camera API was through looking at your code. Oh, like, cool. Most of what I learned was through looking at your code because I didn't even know they had a camera two API and I looked at yours and I dissected it basically. Nice. And uh, it helped, it helped me a lot. Like that's great to hear. Huge amount. Yeah. Maybe I should have kept it up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it worked and it worked. It was, uh, it was very reliable. Like usually camera mm -hmm. stuff is not reliable because of the different very devices true. like you described, but yours mm -hmm. was really reliable. It worked on a lot of different devices with weird resolutions. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think it was because mostly um, you, you, I think, what did you, you used, uh, uh, there was a resolution that you used for almost everything. And that was like pretty safe, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like when you start going full screen is when you run into problems because you have the different, the, like yeah. some random little screen size. It's like a little bigger or a little smaller than like what everything is usually. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing with the camera is that Apparently, manufacturers like to mount their camera sideways in different, yeah, sideways. Yeah. So you have to mess with the orientation. It's, just, it's so annoying. Yeah, and like one will be one will be like uh, correct the way you would intuitively think, and then the other one yeah. will be like rotated. Yeah. Uh, it's like <laughs> camera stuff is the worst. The it worst. Is. It really is. Um, okay, so uh, your your tar your target job. Mm -hmm. You're you're allowed to talk about that, right? Like since you don't work for them anymore. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So tell us about the interview process at Target. Yeah. So surprisingly, it was not it was not very hard. That was my first like actual real kind of serious interview. Like Skill Fitness, the, the startup before that. Uh, my dad kind of uh, set up the meeting, and the people were friends. So like that wasn't that serious. The Skill Fit uh, the Regal Solutions job was an internship, so I wasn't really worried about it um but target was like serious um they had me draw some basic algorithms like java algorithms on a whiteboard not like data structures or anything but like some basically compressing letters um so if you had like three a's and two b's and a c it would be like a three b two c oh, okay that, that sort of thing um yeah 
so they had me write some basic algorithms. They got an understanding of um, what I know about Java. Uh, asked me about like Rx Java image loading libraries I like to use. Um, kind of basic stuff like that. So it was actually a pretty easy interview process um, compared so to what you would see at a place like Google or the big guys. Yeah, if they didn't ask you to solve any like difficult, it's the difficult like technical random mm -hmm. questions when you're yeah. under the gun. That's yeah. that's I think that's very very hard to do. Yes, yeah, well, even if you know this stuff, it's it, with that pressure. Like you're interviewing yeah. at Google, ooh, and you're you're gonna panic. Mm -hmm. You will definitely panic. Well, I actually I did have a call. I, I wasn't. Um, I didn't actually end up interviewing with Google, but I did have a, a brief call with a recruiter there to see kind of what the process was. And they gave me a list of example questions that they would ask, and they were they were really really hard questions. <laughs> so Google Google does go with the straight like data algorithms and structures. It's the same with still. Amazon. Uh, oh, really? I I've also I've been on a call. I didn't interview, but I mm -hmm. same kind of thing. I went on a call with a guy who reached out, and I'm like, oh okay, I'll see what this interview is about. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they it's like the standard. They're gonna ask you difficult shit on the spot. Yeah. So have fun with that. Pretty much. Yeah. That. From what I understand, the main reason they do that is because, well, like, obviously, you're never going to use that with mobile engineering. But they they kind of treat every engineer, um, like at Google, they treat engin every engineer that works there as if they are working on the search engine because the search engine obviously is their core products. So they kind of assume that everyone that works there understands how their core product works, which isn't very ideal for a mobile application developer. But Interesting. Yeah. Huh. That that is very strange. It I is. Think. It is. Okay. Um, so what was it like, uh, after you got the job at Target? Oh, actually, so the interview obviously went well at Target. Mm -hmm. It did. Uh, um, what kind of happened after that? How did they, what was there like a secondary interview? Like what kind of a process did they have after that? So like most companies have interviewed for, they had a, they had a screening call first. So they get a feel for your technical ability over the phone. Um, and then they brought me in and I, I think the interview process was, like six hours, so I had, um, I think it was like three interviews, a lunch, and then one more. So they just had me meet with various engineers from um, the team that I ended up getting hired for, all of which had their own uh, constructed questions or problems that I had to solve. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty deep interview too, six hours. Yeah, yeah, most of them were, well, some of them were actually not as technical, they were more like, um, like a Q&A session. So maybe like a, like a, maybe even like a QA engineer or someone that wasn't necessarily a programmer would kind of um, see how you would work with people that aren't engineers, like your communication abilities with um, the product manager or that makes sense. Your, yeah, that kind of stuff. So yeah, see, so just they're they're checking you out to say if they think they can work with you. Basically, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you're like yeah. a level-headed normal person mm -hmm. um basically that's what, yeah. which i think is a good thing to do you got to get to know the people you work with if you don't like the people you work with it's going to be really terrible going into work every day right exactly yeah. okay and uh so yeah so about target i guess more specifically um they were my first agile company that i worked for um so they use like you know jira uh they did all the stand-ups the sprints everything which it was my first experience with that but i've I've used that at every single company I've worked for. Well, I've only worked for one other company since, but I've noticed that most tech companies these days use that same format. So it was my introduction and see like the full. Maybe we should talk normal. a little bit about that. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. There's probably some people who don't know. Um, oh, sure. So can you, can you talk, talk about it a bit? Yeah. So agile, um, agile is a methodology that most tech companies these days use. Um, where every morning you have a stand-up, so every engineer on the team gets around. They literally stand in a circle, um, talk about what they're doing today, uh, talk about what they did yesterday, uh, mention any challenges they've been having. Uh, my boss, project managers, whatever, they um, they talk about what else is going on at the company that day, um, kind of just pass on important information. And then we manage tasks using uh, a board. So if anyone's used Trello, it's, it's like Trello, but uh, a lot more complicated in advance um, where you have boards with columns for like to do in progress in review done. Um, mm -hmm. So it helps engineers, product managers, QA engineers, everyone manage tasks. Um, we keep track of how much work is being done every month or every week uh, and make sure people aren't getting too much work taken on or not enough work taken on. Um, I think it's a pretty good way to do things in general. Yeah, me too. I mean, what do you think? 
Yeah, I like it a lot, actually. Uh, before I joined Target, apparently they were using Waterfall, which is another methodology that's kind of just randomized. So you just basically take on as much as you possibly can in a month and don't worry about your workload or so something like that. I don't know the specifics, but... Yeah, I don't know either. I, I only know Agile because at the one job I did have, I worked in IT and that's what we did. You know, we mm -hmm. stand around in the circle every morning, yeah. uh, talk about what we do today, what we did yesterday, what we're going to do, what we're kind of working on the long term, how things mm -hmm. are going, the status of everything. The managers mm -hmm. would like poke you and see if you knew what you were talking about. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I mean, that, I don't, I thought it was a pretty good way to do things in mm -hmm. general, though. Yeah. Team check ins are nice. Yeah. It was just like a little check in to see if you were doing anything pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's that's kind of how you worked at Target. Uh, how were the how were the how was the people at Target, and how uh, was like was everybody really qualified? Do you find people were underqualified? How how was all of that kind of thing? How was the work environment? I guess. Yeah, I, I would definitely say people were very qualified. Um, and actually, the work environment was very, I would say, modern. Um, Target is based in Minneapolis. Their headquarters is actually in Minneapolis, so I worked at their main headquarters, um, their international headquarters. Uh, they have like two or three very large buildings right in downtown. Um, so it was kind of like, it was, it was a pretty high class place, I would say. Um, everyone was very qualified, everyone was very nice. Um, all the, the tech teams were uh, in the same building, so you had easy access to like the server engineers, um, literally everyone. Um, the iOS and Android engineers were on the same floor. Um, that would be nice, because if you had any issues, you could just go talk to them pretty much. Yeah, there was very close contacts. Um, and I actually found it very cool. Target was very, 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 very diverse. Um, like my boss was female. Um, there was a very nice mix of non-Caucasian people too, which is kind of rare to see at 10 companies in California, I've noticed. Oh, really? Um, Interesting. Yeah, there's a very high percentage of white male people in tech, um, which pe companies are definitely trying to change. There's a lot of... Um, I wonder why. Because, I mean, India, for example, has a massive tech industry. You'd think a lot of Indian people would be going to California, the Target, tech hub. Target was almost entirely, almost my entire team was Indian. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, that say, makes yeah. sense logically to me because mm -hmm. there's a huge tech industry there. Like, I don't yeah. know, 50% of my audience on YouTube is just just India, then mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I actually think Target used to be, um, their, their, their tech team used to be all based in India. Um, and when they decided to stop outsourcing, uh, they actually moved a big part of their team to Minnesota, um, which is what, kind of bred the team that I was on. So it was, it was cool. Um, cool. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. That sounds like a nice place to work, actually. It was very. So yeah, why, if, you live, if you live in Minnesota, that's the tech company to be at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's their headquarters and mm -hmm. uh, it's in Minnesota, then that's probably, that's like having, you know, that's like Google headquarters in mm -hmm. wherever they're from. That's like, it's probably going to be a pretty big, fancy building. Yeah, Best Buy is actually based in Minnesota too, but uh, I actually heard that most of their Android team is based in Seattle, even though, their headquarters is in Minneapolis. So I actually, I had a job offer there and they told me that I would basically be working by myself or with another person uh, at their headquarters building as an Android engineer. Oh, and then the rest of the guys <laughs> would be somewhere else. In Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So um, so you were strictly an Android engineer at Target then? I was, yep. Okay, and how, how big was the team that you worked on? Uh, initially, I think it was 12 to 14 people. Uh, and eventually, we actually adapted this thing called Jobs to be Done. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Jobs to be Done. No idea. So that's like a methodology that kind of works on top of uh, Agile. So it's largely based on figuring out what your consumers like and acting on that rather than like a company like Google um, saying, this is what the people want, we're going to make it. And then you end up with like three chat apps because <laughs> they, don't, they don't actually understand what their consumers want. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, so they would actually go out to stores and offer customers like a ten dollars gift card to provide feedback. So they would actually bring a phone with them or a tablet with them and have the the person use the app, uh, like maybe with an experimental feature that isn't out yet, and they would provide feedback. So all these product managers would collect tons and tons of feedback from people, maybe even like with a recorded video, um, and they'd bring them back, have meetings, and people would actually take into account what their customers want. So. Sounds like Target's doing the right things. It, they, sounds, yeah, it sounds like a good place to work. It's and, a great I mean, company. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what do I know? I'm just <laughs> an un unemployed YouTuber. <laughs> but, but I think practically speaking, 
that sounds like a good way to do things overall. Like everything that you've told me about Target sounds really good. Yeah, and they actually, they branched that methodology out into a team-based solution. So every feature in the app would have their own mini team. So uh, that mini team would have an Android engineer, an iOS engineer, a backend engineer, a product manager. So like you would have a full, uh, what's the word? Like a, I guess a full stack team, uh, like a self-containing full stack team um, mm. that was focused on one specific feature uh, and making sure that you're implementing specifically what customers of that feature want. So, so what, what feature were you part of? Like what did you, what were you part of? Yeah. So when they moved to that methodology, I, uh, I led the wallet projects for the mobile app. So if you use the Android app or the iOS app now, uh, there's a tab called wallet. So you, oddly target security doesn't like NFC, so they don't offer mobile payments at all, like with Android Pay or Google Pay or sorry, Google Pay or Apple Pay. Um, so when you go to the register at Target, you can scan the barcode on your phone and it'll uh, it'll pay with your red card, apply gift cards, apply coupons, um, cartwheel, all that cool. sort of stuff with one single barcode at checkout. So cool. I led that project for Android when I was there still. So you, you, were, you were a senior, you were a leader at Target. I was actually not, uh, surprisingly, uh, I was going to be before I left to move to California, but, um, I guess that was probably kind of my test. Um, they put me on a team of my own as the the, the sole uh, Android developer to make a feature. Probably, so yeah. It was, it was a fun experience. That's a cool feature. So why? So that that's a nice segue. Why did you leave Target? What what brought you to Square? Yeah. So um, at the ends of my Target career, I actually had a pretty bad uh, relationship, and um, I think it was at almost four years at that point. Um, which is actually what was keeping me from moving beforehand. I, I had some opportunities to work at Facebook as an intern back in the day, um, like in high school, but I passed it up because I had a lot of connections back in Minnesota, um, mainly like a significant other. Uh, I wasn't ready to leave my family, that that sort of thing. So oh oh, when you said uh, you had uh, a, it was a, a personal it was, it was a it was a breakup. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. So that ended after four years, and I decided it was time for an environment change because I actually um, I bought a house maybe a month or two before that. Um, so I kind of want, I wanted to get a, get out of that house. I wanted to get out of Minnesota. Um, so I one day just decided I'm going to sell my house and move to California. Uh, <laughs> so within like maybe a month or two, um, I interviewed at Square um, and just said, fuck it, I'm going to leave and <laughs> go to California. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so how did you get, how did you get the interview? You just started, you just posted on your profile that you were looking for a job or what? Yeah, I went on LinkedIn and uh, turned my job availability to available. And, and that's within, all it took. Within a day, yeah, a recruiter from Square contacted me. So that's so, all you have to do, those yeah. of you out there trying to get jobs. All you yeah. got to do is turn on that little button on LinkedIn, and you too can have a job at yeah. Square. Social media is a lifesaver. <laughs> I'm kidding about that, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to talk, talk too much about Square, as you know, but... I will yeah. say that they are hiring and that it's a great company to work for. Okay. So if you're an Android engineer or an iOS engineer, check it out. <laughs> so there you go. There you go, <laughs> folks. Um, yeah, so we can't talk about Square. Now what the hell, hell else do we talk about? <laughs> so um, so your family, all of them got up and moved with you too? Your, your Not dad, all of them, but... But a yes. lot of them. Yeah, so I actually started dating someone right before I moved to California. Um, and she decided to move with me. Um, my mom stayed behind, my grandparents stayed behind, but my dad and his girlfriends came with as well. Um, well, my mom was remarried and they own a house, so. Yeah, it took me a second there, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so my dad and his girlfriend moved out. Um, my dad was able to keep his job as a sales director at Augusto. Um, I work remotely. Uh, so they actually live in Oakland, which is uh, brother city, sister city. I don't know which, what you call it, uh, to San doesn't, Francisco. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess enough people came with me to where I was comfortable to to make this big move. And so, and now your life is probably drastically better now that you've uh, ended your shit relationship by the sounds of things, and yeah. uh, got a new job at a pretty sweet company by the sounds of things. Indeed, yeah. And uh, yeah, and there's no so, snow. Yes, yes. Minnesota has a lot of snow, doesn't it? A ton. Yeah. Uh, before I left, I was shoveling like. I can't even remember how much snow it was. There, there was so much snow that I could not get my car out of my garage for days. Yeah, that's terrible. Like a, a school bus got stuck behind my house. Like it was, it was so bad. 
I was sick of it. <laughs> why would you? Why would you want to live in a place like that? I definitely wouldn't. Well, s snowboarding is the only reason I can think of. But oh, yeah, you can do that true. here. You can do that here too, I guess. So yeah. So uh, so California is <laughs> awesome. You you would say it is. You enjoy living there. Other than the price of living, yeah. Yeah. What uh, if you don't mind talking about it? What what are like your your living costs? Your living expenses? Yeah. So I live in a one bedroom apartment. I think it's like six seven hundred square feet, uh, and I pay uh, three thousand three hundred dollars a month. For that, wow. Yeah. Um, although the the city has a pretty high minimum wage, um, and wages out here definitely compensate for the living costs, but still, I'm probably gonna end up in Berkeley or Oakland, which are just across the water, basically, because it's like a two thirds to a third of the price that it is in SF, because SF is just in such high demand. Everyone wants to be here. So I heard there was like a big homeless problem there. Oh yeah, it's so bad. I, like there's although, a lot of homeless people. There's even like college students living in their cars and things like that. Yeah, I live by Alamo Square, which is um, home of the famous painted ladies. If you've ever seen Full House, it's the oh yeah, okay, yeah, the, the colored houses that you can see in like the introductions. I, I live like two blocks from those. Um, so this neighborhood is actually very, very high end and nice. So there's not a lot of homeless people, but if you go into like downtown SF, um, it's it's terrible. The new mayor is trying to clean it up, but uh, there's like waste, human waste on the street sometimes, um, like needles, just random crap oh, all over the street. Oh boy. So they're, they're trying to clean it up. It's it's kind of a challenging problem, I think, for city officials because there's like yeah, a moral question. Yeah, there's a moral question of like, should I go round up all these homeless people and force them into like an institution? You know, it's it's almost like a human rights issue in a way. So I don't think they really know completely what they should do about it yet. Not a problem that I would want to touch. Indeed. I have yeah no idea i wouldn't even <laughs> suggest anything no yeah. idea it yeah. sounds very difficult it's a challenge for sure yeah um well i got questions for you hey <laughs> i know a lot of people wanted to know what a full stack developer is so can you tell them what a full stack developer is yeah so a full stack developer means you're um you're the full circle of uh, of an application, so you work on mobile applications, you work on front-end websites, um, like the UI of a website, um, and you work on the back-ends, uh, which is uh, the logic that runs on the server. So it's like the what the user never sees, but it's what powers an application. So if you have a database or um, an API that provides data to a mobile application, that's the back-end. So I do the mobile front-ends, um, the web front-ends, and the web backends. Um, so that's altogether. so. This is interesting. This is something I didn't know. I thought personally, I thought the term full stack developer was only in regards to web development. So you would mm. be to be a full stack web developer was the only way you could be a full stack developer, meaning database interactions, uh, front end of the website. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah all, I, that's what I thought. But mm -hmm. I never, I never even thought. That, yeah, for a mobile too. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just mobile. Mm -hmm. You can be a mobile full full stack developer. It's the mm -hmm. same principle. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't think about that before either. Yeah, I didn't. I always just assumed that it was strictly web development. And if you were an Android engineer, uh, you just had to know all those things. That's just the way it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, that makes sense, too. Yeah. All right. So what else do we got? I got questions here. Cool. So how, OK, so I was going to say, how did you train yourself to be a full stack developer when I originally thought it was web development? But never mind. Mm. <laughs> um, let's see. So OK. I know a lot of people want to ask this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you does your does Square? Oh, I can't ask about Square. What do you What do you think about Flutter and things like React Native? Have you ever used them? Played around with them at all? Yeah. So, I guess I have mixed feelings about that. Um, I'm actually I haven't tried Flutter yet. I'm I'm very interested in trying Flutter, but I'm not the biggest fan of Dart. I guess um, I'm a huge fan of Kotlin, and I I like Native frameworks the best because um, they work better. Yeah, they work better. Um, there's better framework API support. You're closer to the to the OS. Um, React Native, uh, it's I guess it's cool, but um, I really just don't like the fact that it's not actually native. Um, there's a lot of gaps. Uh, yeah, why do they call it React Native? Just to attract people, or what? Well, it's it's the React framework um, with the addition of the ability to mimic a native application. So like. You know, React for web. Um, you can make websites with the React framework. Um, yep. So native just brings it to the to the mobile platform. Um, I actually like React a lot. Uh, the state management is just super cool. Um, 
which is actually modeled a lot of frameworks that I've used at jobs I've had, um, which I can't talk about. Um, <laughs> but the overall React workflow is very cool. The state management is very cool. Um, but I just I don't like hybrid frameworks a lot. So. <laughs> okay. Um, what about machine learning? You know anything about that? You ever? I guess you can't talk about Square, but in your personal opinion, how do you feel about machine learning? Have you played around with it? I do love machine learning as a concept. Um, like all the applications I use, pretty much take advantage of it. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to play with a play around with it quite yet, uh, mainly because it's a lot of math, and sometimes I get lazy when it comes to mathematical stuff. Um, yeah, you got to use your brain. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wanted to try it though. It looks very cool. Uh, okay. What uh, next question is? Uh, I I have a lot of I'm I'm an Android channel. Obviously, a lot of people mm -hmm. learning Android, looking to get their first job. Maybe they're in university learning Android development. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the most effective way to learn Android development, or mm. you know any any programming language too? Yeah, I guess people always ask me what books I've used, or um, I guess just in general the materials I've used. Um, a lot of what I did when I was growing up learning programming is literally just look at source code. Um, like on GitHub, uh, I, I find myself not able to really uh, comprehend large amounts of text very well. I kind of just get bored of it. Um, Me either. I can't. I like. I just can't. Like I yeah. try to read it, and it within like a page or two, I'm falling asleep, and yeah, I can't yeah. even keep my eyes open. Yeah. So I've yeah I've, I've looked at tons of examples on websites. Um, like if I if I'm making an app when i was making my first apps i guess would be a good example um i would literally look up just type in on google um a question for how to do something so every time i would make a component of my app i would just continuously type in questions on google on how to do it um that's the way to do it that's what yeah. i think yeah um, and also, yeah and also watching um videos uh like courses on specific uh specific things that you can do on android like i guess probably like a lot of the stuff that you've done um little right components like how to use a recycler view, yeah. how to set up whatever. Yeah. You know? I, what, what's what's the website you published to again? What what is that called? Uh, Plural site. Plural site. Yeah. We actually we added license to that at Target. So um, the the Target engineers would actually use Plural site even um, just if they were trying to learn something new. So that's a very valuable very valuable resource for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's where Plural site gets like mo most of its income. Like almost mm -hmm. all of its income is from corporate memberships where a company will buy a corporate membership for every every one of their employees. It's pretty smart. I think so. Um, but Plural is definitely a good website. This year, I don't think I'm going to be making, I mean, I'm not going to say I won't, but I <laughs> probably won't be making any courses for them because mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on my own website. Nice. Um, I just figure at the end of the day, I'm building their platform while right. I build mine. Right. That's, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Taking a massive pay cut though. I'll tell you that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Pluralsight, it's basically, that was 90% of my income. Oh, so wow. Now, so now I'm like, okay, uh, going to stop <laughs> that. <laughs> are you, so are you going to publish to YouTube or? Um... Yeah, so uh, this kind of, this year's sort of plan, I guess my strategy is I'm, I'll am i make uh, one kind of complete course on my website a month at least. So it'll be like building something real. Like I just made an SQLite for beginners course mm -hmm. with the room persistence library. Nice. Uh, so that one, I just showed them how to build like a note keeping application. Uh, that one was going to be free. Then uh, the one before that, I built an app that's similar to Spotify. So I basically copied. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like a copy. It's a very simple copy, mm -hmm. but it uses all the newest kind of audio streaming stuff that they recommend in the documentation. Ah, nice. That one's you have to buy or you have to be a member on my website to watch. So that's kind of the, that's the plan. It'll probably be like paid course, free course, paid course, free course. The free courses will go either on YouTube or on my website, the paid courses cool. on my website. That sounds really cool. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's going good so far. The first month of uh, subscriptions is more than I thought it was going to be originally. So things are looking good. People seem to be happy. They're engaging and telling you what they want to see. Nice. Uh, so yeah. I think you get paid by subscriber count too, don't you? Or you, you start to gain money or is it viewers? It's views. So? Oh. YouTube is views. Um, subscribers, you don't get paid for subscribers, but it's a pretty mm. good indication of how many views you're going to get mm. typically. Right. More subscribers means I show up on their feed, means they probably watch. Um, and then so YouTube pays, YouTube doesn't pay much. Like I get, I think it's insane how low they pay actually when you <laughs> think about it because I get 200 to 250,000 views uh, a month. That's a mm -hmm. lot of that's a, that lot a lot of people to look yeah. at your shit. 
And um, I make like three to 400. Well, no, that's Canadian. Uh, it's actually 200, like 250 to 300 US. Oh, wow. That's, that's a little ridiculous. It, I think it's insane. So <laughs> YouTube is not a way to make money practically yeah not for the it's it's more of an advertising tool is what right. it is right yeah so if you want to become a youtuber you can <laughs> also make 250 bucks a month <laughs> well that's 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 a good side side thing to have i guess yeah yes yeah, i mean i i like it i personally mm -hmm. i sort of stumbled into this uh when i graduated or actually my last semester of school i was trying to get a job because I had a physics mm -hmm. degree. I'm like, how the hell am I going to get a job? So I thought, oh, I, I'm going to teach myself the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started making videos and I thought this is, I, I just loved teaching. I mm -hmm. kind of fell in love with teaching. And uh, so that's kind of where I'm going. Nice. Um, so you said books suck. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Just looking at my questions over here. Uh, when you said that, um, so you said something that I always tell people mm -hmm. whenever they ask me, what's the best way to learn Android programming? <clears throat> I always say, come up with an idea. It has because it has to be something that interests you. It mm -hmm. has to be something that makes you want to build it. Yeah. Um, come up with an idea and literally Google every single step. Mm -hmm. So, like first step, uh, you need somewhere to store data. You're like, yeah. oh, how do I use a database? Yep. Eventually, you're going to stumble across the different types of databases. You're going to say, okay, which type of database is best? And you're like, like you just kind of you're just kind of going along and slowly piecing it together mm -hmm. this thing that interests you yeah uh, you're gonna you're gonna learn you're gonna get the whole picture and you're gonna stay interested which is the most important thing yeah and and eventually you memorize all the steps too and then you just become uh, yeah eventually yeah, yeah. yeah uh, people people worry about it and they say they worry about oh i can't come up with the, the biggest thing the thing i hear most often is um i can't come up with this stuff on my own i'm always googling and mm -hmm. i just say how long i always ask how long you've been doing it they're usually like oh i don't know four months <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, try Do it for more. two years. Yeah, and then <laughs> then ask me the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, so most effective way to learn that was gonna be my next question, but I, I think it sounds like you agree with me that that is that is the best way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So, what do you do for fun? Oh, good question. Um, aside from computers, uh. Well, I love to play video games, as we've talked about uh, recently. I have a, a lot. Um, I have a, a gaming PC and a PlayStation 4 um, Pro. So I actually I sold my VR headset. I used to have an HTC Vive, um, which I, I loved. But it would be useless here because my space is not big enough for VR. Um, but uh, on PlayStation, mostly now, um, I play Black Ops, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, God of War. Um, How is Red Dead Redemption 2? That game oh, looks it's, sick. It's so amazing. Yeah, it's totally worth the money. It's it, the only thing is it's not for PC. I'd buy it. I'd buy it That's instantly. Right. Yeah. But well, I actually I I got rid of my PlayStation uh, for a while and ended up getting another one just to play God of War because God of War looks so amazing. Um, yeah, those and, are cool games too. And Red Dead Redemption ended up just adding on to that. So yeah, those I already beat it, but that was definitely uh, my game of the year. I would say, uh, well, game of last year. I'm, I every like every once in a while I check like every couple of weeks I'm like oh, I wonder if they're gonna make it for the PC I wonder if they're gonna make it for the PC because I'm not gonna buy a PS whatever the hell three four I don't know four. no four yeah yeah <laughs> I'm not gonna buy one they're like six hundred bucks or something I think they they went down pretty recently maybe yeah but I, I live I in know. Canada where the US uh, where the where the yeah. dollar is like fifty percent of the U S dollar right now wow. so or it's close it's not that but it's close it's like I don't, I don't know. Very close to that. It's shit. Tariffs must have gone up, huh? And our wages are lower. Oh, Doesn't no. make any sense. Yeah, it's actually, I, I work with like three Canadians on my team that came here because they couldn't get jobs there. The wages are like double. Like your your software development wages are literally like double. Wow. And then the dollar on top of that. Oh, uh, so, yeah. So it's like, okay, here, we'll double your wage. And now we're going to give you 40% more for a conversion. Right on. <laughs> So, That's kind of sad. Huh. Well, it, it can be good, I guess. Um, like when I was working for Pluralsight, it was great because they paid me in US. So that was cool. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so what else do we got? Uh, so what, uh, this is kind of my question. So what's the end goal for you? You're an you're excellent developer. I've looked at a lot of your code. You helped me learn about the Camera 2 API specifically. <laughs> I've also looked at your material dialogues um, on GitHub. That is awesome. Thanks. Uh, especially because they no longer 
uh, they deprecated the progress dialogue. And I thought the progress dialogue was awesome. Mm -hmm. And they just, just decided that, no, you're supposed to not use that anymore. So your, your um, GitHub gives you a nice kind of customizable dialogue that I love. That's Although awesome. I did, I did actually get rid of the progress dialogue on the new version of uh, Material Oh, did dialogue. you? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I, I rewrote the whole thing in Kotlin um, pretty recently. So all of, like if you use input dialogues or file dialogues, they're all, um, they're all in separate modules. Um, because it can take advantage of Kotlin extension functions. So I was able to modularize. Mo modularize I can't all. say that word either. I can yeah, never say it. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, Modula. all the features are modular. Mo modular. This is how I say it. I'll give you, I'll give you my tip. Because whenever, whenever I've, I've, I think about this a lot because when I'm teaching and I'm, I realize, mm -hmm. damn it, all these people are listening to me and I can't say this, <laughs> this goddamn word. It's, so what I do is I say modulize. Mo oh yeah! Instead yeah. of modularized. Oh, no one is, will no one will catch it anyways. No one catches it, it anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's smart. That's smart. And then you do don't that. sound like you can't speak. <laughs> modularized. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. See? Way better. Works every time. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, what's uh, what's what's next for you? What, like, for example, why why are you coming on my podcast? Um, what what do you have? Kind of, where do you want to work? Do you want to stay at your job? I guess you probably can't say that. <laughs> um, yeah, what what does Aiden look like in five to ten years? What are your goals? So I do probably plan to stay at my current company for quite a while um, to climb the ladder a little bit. Uh, and I guess my my long term goal has always been to end up at Google, but uh, I feel like Google has just gotten so massive that it's not maybe the best company to work for because it takes months to get features through. Like decision making is just it's so corporate corporate. Corporatized. That's yeah. Why? Why Google? Like, what? Why do you want to work at Google so bad? What turns you on about Google? Uh, like I, I've almost always used an Android phone. Um, I love Chrome OS. I use all of their services, almost all of their apps. So I've always just been a big fan of uh, Google and their mission and their services and everything. Um, so it, it was always appealing to be able to actually work on the things that I use every day, uh, especially Android itself like versus just making apps like actually working on the, the os itself um so that that was always appealing but these days i'm almost kind of leaning towards eventually owning my own company uh i feel like something that's kind of self-sustaining uh where i get to make my own decisions and make things go as slow or fast as i want would be very nice um yeah i think that i i mean just my opinion but the google thing i I think that would be like the last thing I would want to do because you would just be like a cog in the wheel. Yeah, I yeah, I, exactly. I it's mean, so I'm, I'm guessing. Like, I don't know. But. I agree. Yeah, it's 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 very massive. And I've actually uh, I've worked with Googlers at Target and at my current company, um, more than one Googler uh, who actually left Google for a change. So I feel like a lot of people who work for Google and think it's a dream job at one point end up realizing that it's just such a big, massive machine that it's really just not the most pleasant thing to do every day yeah it's gotta it's gotta be it's gotta like blunt creativity that's what mm -hmm. i think yeah and uh, i know personally i'm never happy unless i'm able to have some kind of a creative outlet where i'm mm -hmm. building something i'm doing things that i want to do yeah that like, stimulate my brain yeah where it, where it, and if i'm going to work for a big company you know i'm just gonna be doing what they tell me to do mm -hmm. that's that's really what it is and even mm -hmm. though i'm sure they pay very well it looks great on a resume you know, you get your lunch for free, whatever the hell else they <laughs> offer you at Google. You get these yeah. little app rooms. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, I still feel like, I don't know once again, but it, you can't, you're probably not going to be that stimulated mm -hmm. creative, cre creatively, I guess. Yeah, and I actually heard it's very competitive there. Like the reason that they have all these half-baked products in a lot of, um, like Allo or I guess Duo is actually pretty great, but all, all these half-baked products that end up, um, buggy or they end up like just completely getting rid of it uh, down the line. Uh, a lot of it is the results of uh, managers making decisions that aren't necessarily good or um, everyone is kind of working to beat everyone else in terms of time or, you know, rushing to get things done because you get paid more if you get things done fast or like almost like Amazon. I've heard the same about Amazon where it's just very, very competitive for Uber. <laughs> seems like every tech company is like that now, really. Yeah, well, it, it makes <laughs> sense because it's it's uh it's just supply and demand. It's like yeah. these these are supposedly the uh, best places to work, so more mm -hmm. people want to work there. You have all the supply, which favors the company, and then mm -hmm. you just get in massive competition, mm -hmm. and it, then 
the company wins, it's the employers that lose. Yeah. In that situation. Yeah, my, my current company and Target actually both were very uh they felt like startups more than they felt like corporate jobs or I guess medium company jobs. Um like all of the the tech stuff is very self contained and they try to make the team small and they um they have very smart executives, very smart uh PMs. Like everyone is working in a very well oiled machine, I, I feel like, um, compared to very, 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 very large international corporations. Uh, yeah, well, when, when you described Target, for example, and you said mm -hmm. you kind of worked in your own little self-sustaining pods, basically, mm -hmm. like you had a, a different engineers for different parts of uh, one component, yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty cool way to do things because mm -hmm. I, I'm sure um, what, you, what you say about it has weight also. Like if you want to implement something a certain way or whatever. People listen to you, yeah. Yeah, people listen to you because you're mm -hmm. part of a small team. You guys are focusing yeah. on that feature. I don't know. That sounds like a pretty good way to do things. I yeah, think. and and they tend to keep the hierarchy, the, the overall hierarchy, pretty uh, minimal, I guess. Like uh, yeah, between the CEO and the bottom engineers, they only have positions that are actually really necessary, and they don't have any people that are just there to get paid and look good. <laughs> hey, are you doing your job today? Yeah. Are you doing your job today? <laughs> right. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna stand around all day. Yeah. Um. So we're we're approaching uh. And actually, we're over an hour now. Do mm -hmm. you have uh, Do you have time to take a look at the old chat here that I've been ignoring this entire time? Oh, I didn't Let's even see. know there was a chat. Wait, there is that? there is a live chat, and I told them to put questions in here, and I ignored it completely. So I should probably <laughs> take a look if you have time. I don't. I don't even see it. You might have to read it off. Uh oh. Well, you have to go. You go to go to my YouTube channel here. I'll send you a oh, link. Okay. Uh, I'll send you a link on Twitter right now. Cool. Uh, let's see messages. Yeah, I guess it would have been. So there's the yeah, there's the video link. Check that out, and there will be a chat, and then we can take there's, a look here. Cool. Okay. Twitter's um, been having issues lately. Twitter. Load. Yeah. Oh, oh it I, got I think, it. Okay. Oh, okay. First question is: Can you speak Hindi? I think I know the answer to that. Can I? Well, well, I have audio going over audio. Hold on. All right. There we go. What was that? Something about Mandarin? No, no, Hindi. Can you Hindi? Speak oh, Hindi? I cannot. <laughs> I, w I wish that'd be kind of cool, actually. I've been uh, thinking about learning a second language. Honestly, if I did, it's got to be something. The only problem is in India, they have like ten different or more different dialects. So, mm -hmm. like, what the hell one do I learn? That's a good <laughs> question for you guys in the chat. That Tell is... me which one to learn because I've been thinking about learning another language and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's somewhere from India, one of your dialects. I don't know which one. Hindi, I think, is the most widely used. I don't really know. So tell me what you think about that. Uh, can you ask what the, fu the future of native Android developer after Flutter SDK and React JavaScript? I think we actually kind of already answered that. Mm -hmm. So let's continue. Uh, Mitch, why you only started at 25? You're a beast. Actually, Aiden's the real beast here, but thanks. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else. Do you do competitive programming? I don't. Aiden, what about you? I do not. I've actually never heard of competitive programming. That sounds well. That would be like um, like you have these uh, what are they called? Those things where you, it's like it's like a coding event. You go to like uh, an event and a bunch of people go and then you you compete to solve a. What the hell are they called? Oh, it's like I think Facebook does something like that. And actually, like a like a hackathon. Hackathon sort of thing. Yeah. That's what it's called. So obviously, no, you don't. I guess yeah, I've done that at my at my past and current employer a few times, where there's a problem that we're trying to solve, and like we need more than one minds to figure it out. So I, I guess I've done that. Okay. I've done a hackathon, but not necessarily like where it's you're competing against someone else to try to beat them to it. It's more like a shared mindset, like help others type of. I think these are pretty common in India because I know mm -hmm. I, I've had another um, a number of people. Um, Say that to me. One guy in particular, I can't remember his name, but I've talked. I talked to him quite often. He said he won a hackathon as a, as part of a scholarship. So, uh -huh. like in schools, they often put them on in India, and uh, it gives them scholarships to schools or oh. uh, internships or things like that. That's cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. They should do that more in the U.S. That sounds very cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I recently started Android app development. I learned Core Java from the rest. Core Java and the rest from Mitch. Right on, brother. 
I get stuck while implementing my own ideas. Oh, this is what we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, when you get stuck implementing your own ideas, you gotta just keep going. If I asked you how long you've been trying this, I bet you you're gonna say something like three or four months. I mean, you, you gotta put in more time. That's 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 the answer. It's just yeah. more time. Yeah, for my stuff, like all the libraries I have on GitHub or uh, the apps that I have published, um, they're always a result of me implementing something that is missing in my own life. Uh, like all my libraries I developed during the process of making an app where a library would be something that uh, would be a useful um, mechanism to reduce duplication, like to not have a lot of duplicated code. Or if I felt like um, the logic I was making would be cool to be able to reuse in another app later or help other people, I end up like packaging it in its own library. So everything I've made has been a result of filling a hole in my life, I guess. <laughs> mm. So there you go. Fill those holes. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see. Can you explain how to design a LinkedIn app or Facebook app feeds? This is being asked in so many interviews. Yeah, I mean, well, aside from the algorithm that's behind it, I mean, they have a very intelligent algorithm that's built by like hundreds of engineers. So Indeed. that's not something that we could explain to you. But like, if you're if you're just talking about like a basic news feed or something that's pretty standard. You would just have somewhere to grab the data from. You could use any database. Firebase is great because it's easy, simple mm -hmm. to set up and display it in a recycle view. Just mm -hmm. scroll the feed. Or if you have somewhere to get the data from uh, using an API, like a REST API, which I'm going to show you how to do in my next upcoming course, actually. And uh, yeah, I mean, Aiden, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I would actually say the exact same thing. I was thinking recycle review and Pretty much everything you just mentioned. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, Mitch, do you play COD and um, Modern, Modern Warfare, Warfare 2? Uh, I think we talked about. I don't. I don't play either of those. Um, the only game I, I really, yeah, Aiden does. <laughs> he plays. He plays all those good games. I suck at them, really bad. <laughs> so uh, the only game that I play, the only, it, yeah, I mean, I would say I play it because I kind of go through periods of not playing. And then playing and not playing is Dota Two. I, I like to play mm -hmm. Dota Two, um, which I have is, a lot of friends that play that as well. Yeah, it's it's a it's an older game now. It's like seven years old or something like that now. Um, but they've it's a very popular game. I still think it's a very good game, um, very competitive game. That's this Indeed. is often why I stop playing it is because I play with my friends and we get so competitive we end up getting angry at each other <laughs> and, and like I don't want to get mad at them. I'm playing a game. That's that's usually what ends up happening, and then everybody stops playing for a while, and then they start playing again eventually. We'll even have tournaments for that game too. It's it's very very competitive. <laughs> a very competitive game, which is why I like it. I like competitive games, mm -hmm. um, competitive strategy games. All right, let's see. SQLite versus Firebase on Android. Where'd you see that? You must be. Oh, you're way down there. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, that's a few. You want to go first or me? Yeah, I can go. Yeah. Uh, I would say SQLite and Firebase are very different um, in terms of use cases. Uh, SQLite would be for local storage specifically, um, and you can wrap around SQLite with something like Room by Google. Um, Firebase uh, is more remote, so if you're working with um, something that needs to be uh, something that you want to actually store not on the phone itself, but like on a remote server, then you would be uh, you would want to use Firebase. Um, Although I guess Firebase and SQLite can be used together. So uh, maybe you have some stuff stored on Firebase uh, that you want to cache on the phone, then you would want to use SQLite for the, the local storage um, caching. But you would definitely need to have um, an idea of if you actually need to store something remotely um, to use Firebase. Otherwise, you can just kind of fall back to SQLite. I think I would say the same thing as you did, actually. Uh, I, I think you described it well. I liked how you also uh, broke down the fact that SQ, SQ, SQLite, SQLite, whatever you want to call it, is um, used for local storage. And if you want to store something on a server or otherwise known as on the internet, then use Firebase. Uh, a lot of people ask me actually often uh, that, that question. Can, you know, so good that you described that. Um, and yeah going to plug my next upcoming course real quick. Thanks, Aiden. <laughs> uh, I'm, this next course is going to be a REST API integration. So I'm not going to be using Firebase. I'm going to be using a REST API on the internet, a free one. Uh, then after that, I'm going to show you how to build a database cache using S SQLite 
and room, the room persistence mm -hmm. library. So room is great. Yeah. Room is awesome. Much better than the old way of doing it. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Much, yeah. Way, way less like <laughs> way less chance that you're gonna make a mistake, which is yeah. what I like. And migrations are so much easier, like going between two different database versions. It's amazing. Yes. I, yeah, I made a I made a video specifically on that because I thought it was so nice. awesome. Yeah, How it, it uh, automatically generates the schema for you. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is literally increment the version. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So what do we got next? That's a fat cat. <laughs> I have two fat actually. Cat. Here's my other one. <laughs> Aiden, a house for obese cats. <laughs> Six hundred square foot apartment, but he's got fifty yeah. pounds of cat. <laughs> and soon a dog, hopefully. <laughs> Oh, yeah, dogs are awesome. I much prefer yeah. dogs, <laughs> personally. But I like both. <laughs> yeah, animals are animals are good. Can you uh, explain future of Python and Ruby? Uh... I so I I only know I don't know Ruby at all personally. I love Python. Python is actually my would I would call Python my favorite language, hmm. even though I don't regularly use it. I use it to build my website, and oh, nice. uh, yeah, it's, well, using Django. And uh, I just, I love Python. I think it is, and it's so diverse. Like you can do pretty much anything with it, mm -hmm. which is why I love it. It's easy to read. It's intuitive. It's powerful. Um, the only reason I don't do it, like I don't make YouTube videos on it is because I'm in, I'm an Android guy. I'm, I probably will eventually, but not at this time. Yeah, Python is also good for machine learning because there's a lot of machine learning fragment, uh, frameworks for it. And um, I've actually, written a lot of Internet of Things applications using Python, um, like on a Raspberry Pi. So it's it's very, very versatile. Uh, Ruby, I know, uh, like my current employer, all the server engineers like to use Ruby um, for backend services. And actually, Target like to use Ruby as well, too. So I think Ruby is very big in the corporate world for um, service engineering. So I, I, I would say they both have a very big future um, just for different purposes. Native apps or Ionic? Native all the way. I, I, I actually really do not like Ionic. So I don't even know. So I have nothing to say here. Um, it's I, Instagram, you see, is Ionic. It's, it's basically uh, embedded web app application inside of the shell of a native app. Oh, I think I read something about that, actually. They, uh, pretty sure I did. I can't remember, but yes. And the companies that use Ionic have mostly switched to React Native these days, I believe. And yeah, that's, eventually. What, that's what it was. That's what it was. I read. I read that in mm -hmm. Instagram did that. They they mm -hmm. were um, using React Native and replacing some kind of embedded thing that they were doing before, which was probably Ionic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any resources for self-taught devs? I mean, we have learned the basics and have progressed, but, but you know what about software architecture? But okay, so he's probably asking. I mean, we've progressed, learned the basics. Uh, how do we learn about software architecture? That would probably mm -hmm. be the question. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of different architectures. If if it's Android specifically, um, I guess this kind of go, goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it's really just a matter of learning from examples or learning from um, questions that you have that you can search on Google. Um, Google's architecture um, components as well can kind of guide you to making a clean, um, healthy architecture for an Android app. Um, so I, I, I guess Google has a lot of really good examples on how to make a good architecture for an Android app. Um, yeah, they, they have a lot of, uh, like recently they've got a bunch of MVVM stuff. I personally yeah. think MVVM is the best. I don't mm -hmm. know about you. I, that's my preferred architecture anyway. Yeah, I, I feel like it's especially important when you want uh, an application to be stable because it allows you to unit test a lot of your logic. I went I went for so long before working at any, like before working at Target, I never unit tested any of my applications or libraries and I ended up with lots of regressions and lots of bugs that would pop up. So unit testing just makes the stress of software development go down a lot. So I personally don't know, I, lo I know zero about testing. Like really? literally, literally nothing. So, I mean, I know that MVVM is good for testing. This is what I read, is. but I don't know. So I, this is something, hopefully, uh, I have a bunch of stuff probably planned for the next uh, few months, but hopefully get into some testing stuff maybe late in 2019. Yeah, that's, I guess a summary of for that would be that um, the reason it's good for your testing is because um, generally you don't unit test the UI layer. So when you have an activity or a fragment, um, I lost you, can't you there that. completely. I didn't hear anything you said. Can you said again. Test. Can you, you can hear me, right? Yeah, you kind of broke up and the screen went crazy. I think the oh. connection kind of went bad or something. Oh, okay. So, but you can hear me now, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, 
so with that NVVM testing thing, uh, the main reason for that is because the the view layer is not unit testable. Like um, activities and fragments and views are not really unit testable. You usually test those with Espresso or um, some type of automated uh, UI framework where it literally the computer goes Press through your application buttons, right? and presses buttons. Yeah. Yeah. So unit testing is a lot faster. You can go through um, unit tests in like seconds. Um, so generally, you want to prefer unit tests, which tests very specific parts of your code um, quickly, which MVVM permits a lot um, better. So I guess that would be a good subject for another video as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, what education do you need to get these job offers and internships? What attracted mm -hmm. Square to you based on your profile? Uh, so that's for you, obviously. Yeah, uh, so as we talked about previously, I do not have a degree. Um, I actually didn't have a degree for my internships either. Uh, it's really more of a matter of having um, some good uh, foundational skills in programming. Uh, it helps a lot to have uh, lots of open source projects or contributions on the internet that, that is visible to um, recruiters or to anyone that may be looking at your profile, uh, making it a decision on whether or not to hire you. Uh, so really, you don't need an education um, formally. You would obviously need an education on, like maybe a self education on how to actually program. Obviously, but they need to know that you know how to do <laughs> shit. That's, yeah, that, yeah, that's the punchline. They need yeah. to be able to look at your whatever you have on the internet or you know whatever. Within a very short time, they need to be able to look at you and say, "This guy might know how to do stuff." Let's yeah. invite him for an interview. Yeah, and they. For like what attracted Square to me, um, I guess I don't really know specifically what attracted them to me, um, other than my experience with Kotlin and uh, RX Java and a lot of the frameworks that they had already been using in their code base now. Um, which I guess I'm not. I don't know if I'm supposed to really talk about that, but. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, Android development in general is going to be mostly the same at any company. So as long as you have a really good foundation of Android development, then you can get a job anywhere as long as you're, if, if you if you try, you can do it. I guess that's a way to say it. So there you go. Um, how how C++. of C++? Do you, what? Do you need to know for the Android NDK and necessary for company interviews? C++. So the question is C++. Do I need to know C++ as, as an Android developer? That sounds so, like a question. Yeah, so I've actually, I've never used NDK at all. Um, so no, you do not need it for most interviews, um, with the exception probably probably for a um, mobile game development company, because NDK is totally a requirement for game developments, um, as far as I know. Uh, but other than that, I'm not really sure of use cases for NDK, so. Uh, next question is, Android development with Java or Kotlin? I very much prefer and love Kotlin. Um, Java is becoming a a senior citizen these days. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, all, all the companies I've worked for so far have ended up using Kotlin. Uh, I think I think Kotlin, like a good way to describe it, a very general good way to describe it is uh, Kotlin is a better version of Java in every way, basically. It yeah, it's a, more with less. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To me, it feels like. Um, it's like Swift uh, for iOS mixed with JavaScript mixed with Java. So it's it's the best of all the worlds um, with strong types um, variables, which JavaScript lacks, which I, I hate. Um. Yeah, but Java, <laughs> JavaScript is 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 like not a terrible language. Like I think it gets a lot of flack, but JavaScript is not a terrible language other than the type thing. How and the nested callbacks, which can Get bad. Although, oh, wait in the sync help a lot with that now nowadays. Okay. I do love Node.js. Node.js is one of yeah. my frameworks of choice for backend stuff. So. Yeah, I don't know it well, but I've used it a bit, like to build cloud functions and things mm -hmm. like that. And uh, I, I definitely like Node.js for sure. Yeah, it's my favorite for sure for backend stuff. Uh, how many subscriptions you got on your website? I don't know if I'm ready to tell people that. Not very <laughs> many. Not not enough to live. That's for sure. Good thing I got money saved up. I'll just say that. <laughs> uh let's see oh bikes yeah you. yeah bikes yeah i realized we never really finished talking about my hobbies other than computer science um oh well we can talk about that yeah so i snowboard i play the drums um i've been in a few bands rock bands um 
yeah, as this this guy saw, uh, I ride motorcycles. I've had three so far. Um, my first was a Honda Rebel. Uh, my second was a Harley Davidson Sportster, and now I have a Triumph um, Thruxton R, which is a pretty fast, uh, sporty bike. It's a uh, they call it a modern classic. So it looks like a classic uh, cafe racer, but it's modernized. Um, yeah, I saw it. It looks it, yeah. I, I would say it looks classic. I know nothing about mm -hmm. bikes, but I looked at it and I thought that looks like an old school bike. But it also looks like it's not an old school bike. I guess it looked like yeah. a clean old school bike. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's classic, but it's also it's it's kind of meant for racing. So it's a pretty, it's actually pretty fast. <laughs> it's, it's it's fun, but yeah, motorcycling is definitely my second hobby after computers. My dad rides too, so that's that's fun. So you've gotten progressively more dangerous as you've uh, gotten new bikes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I went from a three hundred cc to a twelve hundred cc, and then to another twelve hundred cc. That's that Which sounds like a big jump. Size. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know nothing about bikes, but that sounds like I mean that's a big jump. You went mm -hmm. like four times the size. So yeah to, yeah, to be more specific, I I went from thirty horsepower to one hundred and ten horsepower, which for a motorcycle is a lot. That's a lot of horsepower. Yeah, I used to have a Honda Civic, and I don't think it had that much horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are those are like lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what soft, oh, uh, what else did you have any more hobbies, your motorbiking thing? Yeah. Motorcycles, snowboarding, drums, video games. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just... All right. What softwares, softwares do we use to increase productivity in work? Mm. That's a good one, actually. So Trello, you mentioned Trello. Do you yeah. Trello? Like, Trello has been more for personal projects, I guess, more than professional, but, um, I've actually more recently been using GitHub projects because it's basically the same as Trello, but integrated with um, GitHub's issue system, which is very convenient. So if you close an issue, it auto automatically moves it over um, to done in the in the board. So I definitely like to use uh, issue or ticket tracking systems like that for productivity. I never thought about that. That's a good idea, actually, because mm -hmm. GitHub's awesome. And uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so it's like a minified version of Jira, uh, which is like the corporate agile ticket management solution that most companies use these days. Um, I surprisingly don't really use a lot more than that. I know a lot of designers and engineers on social media like to use Todoist or Google Keep or other like list management tools, but I really just don't tend to use those as much because I find myself forgetting to even pay attention to them on my phone when I, everything is on my computer. Uh, yeah. And I'm, yeah I'm, I'm stuck on my code. I don't, yeah, I don't really use uh, I tried using Trello for a bit, but I just like it found I I got I don't know I just didn't get into it I guess I just uh, I have a whiteboard I usually white mm -hmm. write things on the whiteboard and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, how long has this video been running? I think wow. an hour thirty minutes. Hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're giving her over here. So oh, <laughs> the guy says you got to fix your collar because I don't have a collar, so it's gotta. Oh yeah, I do. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that like half an hour ago but oh well uh new to this guy who is this guy what is his handler so i'm, I'm guessing they're talking about you um aiden follow follow stead did i say that right close enough follow stead, <laughs> follow stead yeah follow stead I would, uh, his it's, like, it's like full it's almost like full 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 follow stead. Stead. Follow yeah stead. all of his links are in the description of this video so you can check out all of his uh most important places do you work on self project when you have a full time job, Aiden? Definitely, yeah. I have a lot of side projects. If you if you look at my GitHub page, you'll see a lot of them. Actually, both so of those were you were working though, right? You built you built yeah. those while you were working. Yeah, some of them, I guess. A lot of them, if if I work on them at work, they actually technically own that work. Oh, like I contractually own it. So I usually try to work on it outside of work if <laughs> if I can. So gotta, they don't try to take it from me. That. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I realized I didn't talk about something earlier too. Um, my first Android app I made when I was 16. Um, if you actually search my name on Google, my full name, and you go down a little bit, you'll see an article titled, um, meet the 16 year old whiz kid behind Boyd. So, uh, my first project was a Twitter clients called Boyd, um, that I made with a guy from, well, two guys from England, a guy from Italy and a guy from, I think Brazil or something. So that kind of, that was one of the big things that kind of got me well known in the Android community, I guess. 
So you're one of those you're one of those young whiz kids. Apparently you're, I am. You're one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, now it's been five, six, seven, it's been seven years since that too. Wow. Now you're just a twenty three year old whiz kid, I guess. <laughs> I must be. <laughs> How things have changed. <laughs> Indeed. Almost twenty first, you'll be twenty four in July now. Oh, you're an old bastard. <laughs> you're gonna die soon. You're right. <laughs> um Question. Oh, uh, yeah. Question for Aiden. What are the minimum technical skills, framework, and core Java mm -hmm. that you need to get a job as an Android developer? That's that's actually a very good question. Um, I guess at my current job and at at Target, um, well, obviously Java is big. Um, Kotlin has actually become very big too. They kind of expect people to know Kotlin these days, um, especially at tech companies in California. At least I don't know about. Uh, other states or India or other countries around the world. Um, but those are obviously the core. Um, I know a lot of companies also like to use reactive frameworks. So RX Java is almost a must um, to understand these days. Yeah, any, a lot any of people, interview I've been to, they've they've asked about RX Java. Yeah, a lot of people find it a little intimidating at first because um, there's so much stuff you can do with it. But when you wrap your head around it, it actually becomes very, very useful and very cool. So I would definitely recommend learning RX Java because it's kind of just a standard thing in the world these days for Android developers. I will be doing a course on RX Java. Nice. So probably in probably March, I think. Somewhere nice. around March. Uh, let's see. Node.js versus Spring Boot versus Laravel versus Django. Which Ooh. would you recommend to learn for backend? That is kind of a hard one. Do you know all of those? Uh yeah, most of them. I I Django and Node.js are the two I've used heavily. Um, my Internet of Things projects that I've made, um, I've had like miniature web servers hosted on a Raspberry Pi with Django. Um, when it comes to server projects um, that provide data to mobile applications, I usually like to use Node because um, Node works very well with JSON uh, being, you know, being JavaScript. Um, so making JSON APIs is very, very, very easy with Node.js, I found. So I always tend to prefer that. All right. How can I test my application on different Android versions and different phones? I developed an app before, but published user issues, many crashes. So he published an app, lots of problems. I tried Fabric, but it didn't help me that much. I get that all the time. I can't, I can't even the Fabric explain. Thing? No, crashes on different devices. It's oh. it's a very it's definitely an Android problem um, to have, especially when it comes to Samsung devices, because Samsung. Why is Samsung such? Why? Why is it with? What is it with Samsungs? They've gotten a lot better recently, but. Uh, historically, Samsung likes to very heavily modify their um, distribution of Androids, so they, they branch off of the Android open source projects and just plow their own logic on top of everything. So they modify all the system frameworks, uh, which ends up, ends up creating a lot of bugs that would never happen on something like a Pixel or a Nexus or, you know, pure, quote, pure Android devices. Yeah, and Samsungs are always, like, from what I've found, it's always... If you're gonna have an issue, it's gonna be with Samsung. Yeah, especially with cameras too, as you may have yeah. noticed with the camera APIs, it's oh, a yeah. very big issue. But uh, Samsung S7s and S8s and 9s have gotten dramatically better uh, as they move away from TouchWiz into this new One UI or whatever they have now. It's they've gotten a lot better. But I, I will say, um, although I think it may cost money, uh, Google does provide a service uh, with Firebase and Google Play Developer Council that you can actually run all of your automated tests on different phones in the cloud. So that is one solution if you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of phones. And Which you don't. So yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pay the couple <laughs> bucks a month and you can use Firebase and it'll do it for you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mitch and Aiden, you, you should also go to Fragmented Podcast. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? No, but I'm up for it, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> it must be another. Sounds oh, like well, someone else's podcast. Like another oh. platform or something? Fragmented um, talker. Oh yeah, looks like they have their own site and everything. It must be another uh, podcast. Oh, publisher. hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'll send them an email, cool. or I'll, I'll post. Maybe I'll post. I'll start posting my stuff there. Maybe I don't know. I'll look into it. <laughs> cool. I will look into it. Uh, Royal Enfield, nice. I like Royal Enfields. What's that? Oh, guy mentioned uh, his motorcycle. Oh, Royal the motorcycle. Enfield. Yeah, three hundred fifty. Nice. DC. That's decent. How different is it to make an Android library than an app? Also, Mitch, could you please make a video series for Android libraries? I would like to do that. I don't know when. Uh, just to throw out a number, 
I'll say later th this year, probably, maybe. And in terms of how they're different, um, an app, obviously, you compile it to an APK. Well, uh, a library, you compile it to an AAR, which is a little package that Gradle resolves um, that contains both your code and your resources, because most Android libraries uh, have resources, as opposed to a jar, which is like a traditional Java library. Um, so really, the major difference being that apps have activities, uh, while libraries have just they tend to not have activities or fragments or any UI related things. They have more um, classes that apps can consume as uh, like a logical provider of some sort. I have a follow up question from Nicholas. He he earlier he asked, um, "What are the minimum technical skills of framework or and core Java that you need as to get as an Android developer?" And you responded with something to do with Kotlin. Mm -hmm. He's follow he's following up and saying he's from the U.S. Uh, let's say the company uses Java, not Kotlin. Mm. Yeah, I guess still the same answer. I think RX Java is really the, the the most important framework to learn these days for any Android uh, Java job. Uh, otherwise, frameworks tend to be pretty different between companies. I guess image loading libraries tend to be pretty important to know too, because that's like the core of every Android app these days. Uh, usually, either Picasso or Glide are, he, are the two he, I've seen. He might be asking more of. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess. And and maybe uh, a web service library. What would you choose? What would you say web service like for accessing uh, APIs? I might be kind of biased because I work for the company that makes it. Um, but OK, HTTP and Retrofit are my two favorites. Retrofit being a wrapper around OK, HTTP that lets you make, um, that lets you build interfaces that map out to network Objects. requests automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Makes like lets you map the request to Java objects. So yeah. if if you are uh, you guys are familiar with Firebase, which probably most of you are, whenever you retrieve something from Firestore or retrieve something from the database, you can map it to an object. That's sort of the same thing that you can do with Retrofit. You can make a request and return an object from the response. So it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit longer of a setup, but um, I think it's well worth it. I that my favorite is the same same answer as you. And a bonus with OK HTTP is that under the hood, it uses um, one of their other libraries called OK IO, which does some pretty crazy cool tricks under the hood um, for memory optimization. So um, OK IO makes, um, it makes it so you don't have to allocate memory as much as you normally would. So it, it does um, some buffering tricks, basically, that um, instead of allocating like a byte array 10 times, say it would allocate a byte array like twice for this, the same request. Or as an example, stuff like that. So cool. you get a lot of optimizations out of using those libraries as well. There you go. You heard it from the Square engineer. <laughs> uh, where where are we now? I kind of lost. Um... Someone said, "Does React Native work well?" It it, it works well. Um, there are just some gaps in it. Uh, sometimes you have to like if you're writing an app that will work on both iOS and Android. Um, sometimes there's functionality missing, so you actually end up having to write. Um, two modules in Kotlin and Swift that run alongside the React Native code. So there are some large gaps, uh, and you tend to miss some APIs that framework uh, that the native frameworks provide. So, Which library is best, Folly or retro Retrofit, to integrate integrate JSON APIs? I think we just answered that. Definitely Retrofit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fragmented, they're talking about the Fragmented podcast. Okay, podcast. So. Uh, I want to learn web development, but I have a hard time choosing library. You mean language, I'm assuming, for web development? Probably our frameworks, maybe. Yeah. So my I like Django, but I don't I don't know an, many others well enough to really give a, a valuable opinion, I think. So maybe Aiden can give you a better answer. Yeah, I'm not sure if he means the, the back end framework, like, like the server library, or if he means like the front end language. Um, he probably, I would, I, my guess would be back end. Okay. Yeah. What do you, what, yeah. I mean, that would be my guess. Yeah. I do, as I mentioned earlier, I do like Node.js a lot. I actually surprisingly love the .NET framework too. Um, traditionally, ASP.NET only works in Windows, but Microsoft being an all new Microsoft these days, um, .NET Core works on Linux and Mac as well. Uh, and C Sharp is also just a great language to learn. Uh, Similar to Java too, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, for websites, I tend to just use straight up HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So I don't really like to use any extra frameworks on top of that because they tend to just get complicated. Um, although I do like Angular and React as web frameworks as well. So I've there's only, lots of options. I've only used HTML, CSS, and JavaScript personally. I haven't played around with React 
or Angular. So my answer is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's yeah, that's what I prefer as well. So uh, Bootstrap also. I don't know if you consider that a language. I mean, but it's pretty framework awesome. CSS framework more so. Yeah, framework Bootstrap is awesome. There's also Materialize, which is like the material design version of that that I love. Uh, um, is that the what website you get that from? Uh, materialize dot or materializecss.com, I believe. I I I was I was used a different one to build my website. It was mm -hmm. like a, uh, I think it was MD Bootstrap, is what it was, and it was oh. like a, it was a or really was it, was it MD Light maybe? I know Google has MD Light. No, it, it was MD MD Bootstrap. I'll, oh. I'll actually pull up the bookmark. It's it's awesome, like so easy to use, and it looks so nice. Uh, where are you? Oh yeah, I found it. Nice. Oh, it looks very nice. Wow. It is nice, and like I said, it's so easy to use. Uh, this, yeah, it's cool. Nice. I recommend it. I think it, they charge you like a hundred bucks or something to get it. I probably could have found it for free, but I said, eh, I'll pay you. <laughs> it looks pretty awesome. They got good, good documentation, which I love. That's like a really important thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I recommend, I recommend that for sure. Um, I'm asking you about the Android framework, not individual libraries. This is, this is Nicholas again. Mm. Um, so you gave your RX, uh, Java answer. He's asking about uh, in the Android framework itself. So uh, things like async task, you know, threading. Uh, I, I would assume that's what he means. What are like the core Android framework specific things that uh, are required to get a job uh, with Java, not Kotlin? Well, that's a hard one because these days I actually don't really use a lot of Android framework classes. Um, so working with Kotlin, we use a lot of coroutines and a lot of things that have totally replaced threading and async tasks. Um, I don't think Target really used a lot of those either. Uh, Rx Java actually provided all of our threading at Target. Um, so I don't know if I have a really good answer to that without providing framework answers. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a tricky one. Uh, I think it like because most jobs will probably ask Android SDK specific things, but mm -hmm. realistically in the real world, like you said, you're using stuff like RX Java, you're using Kotlin coroutines, uh, you're, you're using uh, image uh, downloading and displaying libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, you're using all of these libraries so that you don't have to do the Android specific things because it's yeah. way easier. So yeah, you don't want to reinvent the wheel these days. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's a tricky question to answer, yeah. Obviously, activities and fragments are pretty core and necessary, uh, but yeah. Other than otherwise. that, though, it's like other everything else is mostly done using uh, architecture. Arch you should know architecture. I would mm -hmm. think no different architectures. Yeah, gotta understand the life cycle of an activity and the life cycle of a fragment generally. Yeah. Uh, use... Know how to use the SQLite database because chances are you're going to be building a database cache at some mm -hmm. point. Um, yeah. So yeah, probably SQLite database stuff. Uh, no fragment and activity lifecycle stuff, how to properly manage fragments, how to properly manage activities, how to probably uh, extend a class, an application class. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. What else do you think? Yeah, I think that's toolbars. That toolbars well. Yeah, All toolbars. Kind of stuff, styles, toolbars, that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, yeah, theming. Yeah. Understanding theming is also theming. Yeah, very important. Yeah, theming as a whole, how, yeah. how that all works. So next we got, I am learning Android dev right now. What should be my first project? Uh, we talked about that earlier. It's gotta be something that interests you. Find something that you mm -hmm. want to build because you have to, the key is staying interested because it's gonna be hard and you're gonna run into problems. Your app's gonna crash. You're gonna look at the log. You're gonna know, you're not gonna know what the hell that means. Mm -hmm. You need to stay motivated and to stay motivated, you gotta be interested. Yeah, and thinking about what you, like if you're, just walking around, like living living life as you normally do. Think of like a think of something that is missing uh, on your phone that you could use in the moments. Think of something that would help you in your life, and that helps you. That that kind of motivates you to actually work on it and make it work because it's something you would use in your everyday life versus something that you would write and maintain, but you would never actually use yourself, which you kind of just get bored of. So yeah, it's like learning learning what people tell you to learn as opposed to learning about something that interests you. Mm -hmm. Uh, how to how to set Git in Android Studio? Uh, I've never had to do that because it picks it up from your system as long as it's installed correctly. Yeah, I don't I don't know either. The only thing I yeah I don't know I don't I maybe you could elaborate on the question a little better. Uh, I was in an Android interview and the interviewer told me Volley is bad to use. Mm -hmm. I forgot why he said that, but can you elaborate on that? 
Do you know? I don't. I don't know. I, I just don't use volley because retrofit's better personally. I think yeah, and volley is very old. I, I think the main reason probably is that volley just isn't maintained as well, and the APIs aren't quite as nice. Um, retrofit, uh, retrofit, and okay, HTTP make it very easy to manage your requests. So, um, like Android being very lifecycle uh, orientated, you have to make sure you aren't leaking data, leaking memory, or anything when your application closes. Um, and Volley is very callback based, so I think Volley makes it a little difficult to correctly manage memory and um, data in the context of an Android app. So I always prefer using Retrofit, uh, not only because it's easy to use, but because uh, the integration with RX Java allows you to automatically cancel requests when your application closes. So I guess that, cool. would, that would be my reasoning for it. All right. I was watching your Google Maps API tutorial all day long. I'm so happy I could follow that. You're welcome. <laughs> it was fun making it. I'm glad you enjoyed watching it. Can you provide a link uh, so that we can know how many different libraries are there? Uh, so that's something I actually do want to do. It would be cool to have kind of a master list of you know the most useful Android libraries, but I mean, I'm sure if I spent like ten minutes Googling, I would probably find that. So you can find you can find lists out there too, like Android Arsenal. I think uh, their website has the list, but it's it's massive because there's probably hundreds of thousands of libraries out there. Obviously, not all of them being right for you or what you want to use, but there are very standard libraries that the Android community kind of accepts. Um, a lot of which are actually made by Square, uh, <laughs> which I enjoy. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's kind of a hard question. Yeah, he probably. I mean, the most val the most valuable list would probably be one um, that pertains to getting a job. What are the most used, widely used Android libraries when it comes to getting a job? That would that would be mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know top twenty kind of libraries you need to know about to get an Android job. I can make that list. That would be hey, wouldn't be too hard. Make it. Put it on your yeah. blog. Yeah. Then I can just point to it. I don't even got to make it. I actually don't even have a blog, but. Well, <laughs> af.codes. I, I could, yeah. Or on Twitter or whatever. Wherever, yeah. GitHub, because you're GitHub, GitHub GitHub, yeah. Guy. yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, What's Android X and Jetpack? Yeah. So I have a blog post on Android X. Android uh, X is great. Jetpack, I don't, I mean, I couldn't give you a good answer. So maybe Aiden can help you with that. Well, Jet, Jetpack is the overall, it's the overarching term for all of Google's new libraries. Um, so Android X is basically the replacement for AppCompat. So AppCompat was uh, Google's way of uh, helping get rid of fragmentation between all the Android versions and manufacturers. Or the unorganized nature of all those support libraries, basically. Yeah, so it allows Google to update um, like view components like toolbars and uh, basically progress material design without um, having to release uh, entire OS updates to get them out there. So they're able to update AppCompat and basically get UI updates out. Um, so Android X replaced AppCompat, so it provides like AppCompat app activity, um, lots of uh, Compat classes that provide backwards compatibility um, for lots of functionality like drawables and colors. Um, Jetpack includes Android X uh, along with the navigation components, the architecture components, um, room for database, um, Basically, all of Google's new stuff. So, if you go to Jetpack, um, the Jetpack documentation, you can see a list of. Oh yeah, uh, now, now that I it. it. Yeah, I remember seeing. I did, I did, I had nothing. I didn't know what Jetpack was, but I remember reading about it, and it's all of those architecture things, mm -hmm. room, all that stuff is all included. It's called Jetpack. Yeah, and they actually, they I think they just made uh, navigation components stable yesterday, or I don't know if it was stable, but they released official support in Android Studio, so you can uh, you can make UI and connect activities to each other like you would on iOS with storyboards, basically, where you're like drag and dropping um, oh, yeah, yeah. pins Android between Android. activities. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten to try yet, but it looks very cool. I just, yeah, I just installed 3.3 today, but I didn't really get a chance to play around with it. But yeah, I saw it. When you install it, what happens, it, it's never done this with any other version of Android Studio. There's like a little pane that slides out and it tells you everything. Just what's new. Yeah. yeah what's new. And that that's, Android Studio, the 3.3 looks much better. Like it the does. UI is all like, it just looks cleaner. It looks mm -hmm. like a 2019 version of Android Studio, I guess. Yeah. But it's still very demanding. They definitely didn't fix that. <laughs> that is true. Uh, how to use Recycler View in a graph? Not hmm. sure what mean. I don't know. I'm not really sure about that question. 
in a graph? You mean like you're literally plotting points on a graph and you want to put a recycle view in it? Or you want to have a recycle view that contains the points that are going to be in the graph? I'm going to move to the next question. Cool. Um, so we're gonna. We're, I want to. I want to go pretty soon. We've been on here for almost two hours. So I'm. Gonna, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. We need to stop. But, but I'm <laughs> glad. One, one last question here. Yeah. The last question. What is the difference between destroying main activity by pressing the back button and clearing the process from memory? So swiping through the apps. Those actually, I believe, are identical to each other. Yeah, because you're you're ending the task either way. Mm -hmm. I, I believe is what it is. So you're, yeah, you're you're killing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm stopping now. No more questions. <laughs> um, was there anything I just, hold on. Maybe there was something I wanted to ask you. I'm just going to check my thing here. Okay, yes. So this is the end. We're ending. Aiden, thank you very much for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for you're, having me. You're sort of a famous developer, by the way. <laughs> so you know, I, I would consider you famous, personally, because I have used your code, and I know a lot of people do, and it's really great. And you're Thanks. only 23, which blows my fucking mind. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, what do you have coming up? Do you want to, do you want to ask the audience a question? Um, do you want to plug something of yours? What, uh, what do you got going on? I, I guess I could, I could plug a few things. Um, well, if you visit my website, af.codes, you can see some of my newer apps. Um, I have a screen recorder app for Android, uh, called minimal, uh, M N M L that I made because, um, all the screen recorders out there that I found have been kind of shitty. Um, too many ads uh, or too many features or just like an overwhelming experience with a bad UI. So I have a new screen recorder called Minimal. Um, I have an app called Knock Knock that I uh, recently started updating. Um, and I have lots of uh, libraries for developers, um, which would probably actually be a help to a lot of the viewers here um, if you haven't seen my libraries in the past. Um, yeah, so check out my website. <laughs> but the uh, material dialogues especially on his GitHub. That's a really good one. I like that one personally. Yeah, it actually passed 15,000 stars yesterday, I believe. Yeah, pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, you don't just get 15,000 stars for nothing. True. <laughs> um, and I've also looked at your Minimal app, the screen recorder mm -hmm. app, and it is nice. It works very well, and it's clean, and it's simple, and I really like it. There's more to come, too, hopefully. It's, it's a challenging API to use, but I'm figuring it out. It's cool. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks again. And Thank you. Uh, looks like you got some other people in the chat telling you thanks. And uh, hopefully maybe in a year or something, when you have done, maybe save the world or something, we can <laughs> do another one of these. My goal is to be like Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you, you can make some, yeah, you can talk to Elon, you figure out some kind of an app thing, go to the space, I don't know. Right. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Talk to you later.